Howdy tank watchers, Jack here with the mother of all Starbase updates for you. That's right, it's finally happening. The FAA has issued SpaceX a launch license for Starship. That means there's no more testing to be done, no more regulatory approvals to be had. It's time to kick the tires, light the fires, and send Starship into space. Barring any last minute delays, and of course contingent on a smooth countdown, in just under 24 hours, we should be seeing the world's largest and most powerful rocket ever created lift off from right here at Starbase. We'll discuss that, plus everything we learned from all of the documents the FAA dropped, and of course, everything else that happened this week. So let's jump right into it and take a look at how SpaceX has been preparing for this historic flight. Next up, as you can imagine, Part of the preparations for the all-important flight test includes the delivery of huge amounts of liquid oxygen, liquid methane, and liquid nitrogen to the orbital tank farm. In the last few weeks, we've seen oodles of these trucks arriving and offloading their contents into the orbital tank farm. So it should be all full and ready to go when the time comes to fuel the rocket. Speaking of fueling the rocket, if you want to know more about the countdown process and what we expect to see and when, be sure to check out the video we posted earlier this week on that topic so you can stay up to date and know what's coming and when. Next up, one of the things that SpaceX continues to test ahead of launch is the system that protects the launch mount from fires and explosions. The launch pad detonation suppression system, or FireX system as we've been calling it, was tested several times over the last week in preparation for the big day. In case you forgot, the FireX system was installed after Booster 7's detonation. It's noteworthy that this system should be activated about 20 seconds before launch. Moving back to the Remedios Avenue site near the Rocket Garden, work continues on Ship 26. One thing we learned this week is that Ship 26 might just be the next in line for flight. As we said in the intro, the launch license for Starship was released this week, and alongside it, there was a 122-page document reevaluating the environmental impact for the first three launches of Starship. The FAA and SpaceX did this to confirm that all is indeed as expected, and everything conforms to the environmental assessment performed last year. The important part of this document for our discussion here is where it states the second and third launches of Starship are not configured to survive atmospheric re-entry. As you can clearly see, Ship 26 does not have any flaps or any heat shield tiles, so it is not configured to survive atmospheric re-entry, which means they could be referring to this ship and the next one, Ship 27, as the next two in line. So does that mean that Ship 25 doesn't fly? Well, we could be reading too much into this document, or SpaceX could change their plans. We'll just have to wait and see. Let us know what you think is going to happen in the comments. Next up, this week we also saw SpaceX load a PEZ dispenser into a test payload bay. This is the same one we saw a few weeks ago, staged over at the ring yard, and that we mentioned was the first one produced in the Star Factory. Maybe we'll even see it being tested soon. Moving back here to the launch site now, and the flight vehicles once again, if you watched our update last week, you won't be surprised that Ship 24 was destacked from Booster 7, despite SpaceX preparing for flight. If you didn't watch our update last week, you should have. But I forgive you. So why was Ship 24 destacked? Well, crews needed to work to configure the FTS, or Flight Termination System, on the ship ahead of launch, and would have been unable to reach this location on the ship while it was atop Booster 7. So, of course, they had to destack it. We'll go over this more in a minute, but first, a merch plug. Be sure to check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com to get all of your merch needs. We've got the awesome Starship First Flight patch that Pauline designed. It comes in patch form, sticker form, t-shirt, and more. We also have, of course, metal prints of Starship and a variety of other rockets. The metal prints look great, they don't need a frame, and they come with everything you need to hang right out of the box. Once again, that's shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Thank you for even considering buying some merch. We really appreciate it. All right, let's get back into it. This week, another thing that happened ahead of launch was that SpaceX's LR-11000 crane did the old duck and cover. Teams moved the massive crane from its location near the former Starship landing pad to a safe distance behind suborbital pad B. Here, the crane has been lowered and will hopefully be safe and secure as Starship launches next door. Good luck, my lifty friend. Another interesting thing we've seen this week is a lot of deliveries to the suborbital tank farm. This wouldn't be that surprising, except we're not expecting anything going on at this location anytime soon. Or maybe we should be. It could be the case that SpaceX is preparing the suborbital pads for the arrival of Ship 26 and Ship 27, immediately after the launch of Ship 24 and Booster 7. As a reminder, Ship 26 has engines installed, so that means it would go to suborbital pad B for static fire testing. Meanwhile, Ship 27 would go to suborbital pad A for cryogenic proof testing. 
Another potential reason for filling up the solar orbital tank farm could be to use it as a secondary storage location for all the consumables at the orbital tank farm. Now, the orbital tank farm can hold just enough propellant for launch, plus a little bit. If SpaceX were to scrub deep into propellant loading, a lot of the consumables used in the process would have boiled off, so they would need to replenish them quickly if they want to attempt another launch in the day or two after the first scrub. Having this stored nearby might mean that tankers don't need to come all the way from their delivery locations and can instead just transfer all the fluids from one pad to the other. Speaking of launch, Another clear sign in the last week or two that we have indeed been getting very close to the big day is the clearing of all the equipment around the orbital tank farm and orbital pad. Thanks to satellite pictures shared on Twitter by our good friend Harry Stranger, we saw that the launch site was almost cleared of all the heavy equipment that we've grown so used to seeing here. Now all that remains are the lifts and ATVs and some vans that are all obviously used to move personnel around. Now, let's move over to Massey's test site, where crews appear to have been working on Ship 25's payload section. With the potential that Starship's second flight will use Ship 26, it's now in question if Ship 25 will be used for anything beyond testing. So, it's interesting to see SpaceX continuing to work on it. What do you think the fate of Ship 25 will be? Once again, let us know in the comments. Maybe it'll be a test article. Maybe they'll scavenge it for parts. Or maybe, just maybe, it will get to fly. We'll have to wait and see. Back at the production site, this week, we also saw progress on the foundations for the new building between the Star Factory and the Mega Bay. The nearby areas are also being worked on, and it looks like more concrete will be poured so that barrels, test tanks, and complete vehicles can be smoothly transported around the back of the Mega Bay and the production site proper. This week, we also spot some interesting pieces of hardware at the delivery and receiving area near the rocket cart. These parts are all labeled as, quote, flame diverter, and they all appear to be of differing sizes, thicknesses, and shapes. At first glance, they don't look like they're parts of a flame diverter, but why would the label be wrong? Certainly, it's something to keep our eyes on in the future if SpaceX is set to build an actual flame diverter, and most importantly, what location they might use that diverter at. And last up, as we mentioned earlier, Ship 24 was destacked from Booster 7 in order to configure the flight termination system on both vehicles for, well, flight. Essentially, right after we got news of SpaceX receiving the launch license for Starship, workers went out to both Booster 7 and Ship 24 and started working on the FTS. In simple terms, the FTS consists of an explosive charge, a detonator, and a control computer that, when armed, tells the detonator when it needs to activate the charge, if it were to be needed. The explosive charges are placed at the location of the common bulkhead on both vehicles, to most efficiently blow them to smithereens, should that be needed. To avoid creating these smithereens prematurely, a physical safety barrier is put in place to avoid any, let's say, anomalies. These are the remove before flight pins that we've seen during the Starship hops in the days of yore. Ahead of launch, these pins, the safety system, needs to be removed so that during countdown, controllers can tell the control computer that is now okay to be armed and ready for when to trigger the detonation should something go wrong. This is what we mean when we're talking about pulling the pins. It means the safety lock on the flight termination system has been removed. So now you know what these teams were doing. And probably by the time you watch this, Ship 24 will be up on top of Booster 7 again and getting ready for launch. It goes without saying, but we'll be going live on the wee hours of Monday morning with our launch coverage. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be an awesome marathon stream, as you would expect. To say this is all very exciting would be a super heavy sized understatement. But I have to say it. This is so exciting. Holy horses, it's finally time. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for everyone that's bought merch. Let's light this candle. And as always, be excellent to each other.